Hello, and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Today's episode is brought to you by your friends at Candid Health. We would like to remind you that the Q&A feature is available. So feel free to send in your questions and comments throughout today's webinar. We would love to hear from you. And with that, I will turn it over to CEO of Candid Health, Nick Perry. Hello, excited to chat with everyone today. Um, I'm going to hand it over for quick introductions from the fellow panelists today. So Marina, I'll hand it over to you to, to introduce yourself. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you all. Excited to chat about everything RCM related today. I'll give a quick intro on myself and then a quick intro on Nourish as well, just in case anyone is not familiar. So my name is Marina. I'm the director of business operations here at Nourish, which means I lead our customer experience, credentialing, and revenue cycle management teams obviously with RCM being the focus for discussion today. And prior to joining Nourish, I worked in management consulting for a long time to span a number of different projects and industries. That's where I really first started to get, dip my toes in the water in healthcare and kind of enjoy the experience, but was really ready to be an operator and help build something from the ground up and most importantly, make it something I was really passionate about. And so that's what led me to healthcare. I worked in an autism therapy clinic for a while, kind of building out strategy and ops, and then eventually found my way to Nourish. And so for some background on Nourish, we are a natural, a national telehealth nutrition therapy provider. And so what that means is we connect our patients with one of our awesome dietitians we have on staff, and um, they then participate in what's called medical nutrition therapy. And on the back end, Nourish is working hard to get that all covered by insurance. And so if you haven't met with a dietitian before, which I'm guessing a lot of people have not, it's very similar to working with a like mental health therapist, you know, more classic therapy where you're getting matched with the provider, you are aligning on, you know, whatever your big level goals are with your, your provider, you're giving them all of your health history. And then together you're coming up with a, an action plan individualized of how you can actually get there. And you're meeting with them week in, week out until you actually, you know, accomplish your goals and then graduate out of care. And, um, and so super excited, as mentioned, like Nourish, we started about two and a half years ago, which is when I joined and we're now at around uh, a thousand providers on our staff. And we serve pretty much you know, all ages, you know, people from all backgrounds, all locations and in every condition under the sun. So excited to chat about some of the different RCM complexities that comes with all that fun as well. Incredible. Pass over to you, Neil. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me and excited to, to chat with uh, Nick, Marina and, and kind of all of you guys on. So just quick background on myself, uh, Neil Fincarni serves as our VP of product management uh, at Highmark Health. And so I've been at Highmark for about five years. I'll kind of give a quick background of who Highmark is as well. But part of my role as product management for, for Highmark Health is really looking at our provider and clinical experience. And so in context of that, I do a lot of work working with uh, a variety of different provider systems on complexity of billing and how to interact with providers in different ways, implications of value-based care, credentialing, what does it mean for our, our patients and customers from a financial experience perspective too. And so I do spend a lot of time kind of thinking about the, the problems across the industry, both on the payer and provider side, uh, that actually make it really difficult for us to deliver uh, the right care that we want for our members as well. And some quick background myself, I've been at Highmark for about five years. Prior to Highmark, also spent time in management consulting. Wasn't a healthcare person by background and, and any of the work that I'd done over here. So I still consider myself a healthcare newbie where uh, three or five years in this space where I'm kind of constantly pushing on, why can't we do things differently? Why are they done in a certain way right now? And so one, I'm excited to, to kind of talk a little bit about kind of the opportunity that I see out there in the marketplace and kind of what Highmark's perspective is. Quick Highmark background. So we are a blended payer provider organization. So most people probably think of us as an insurance company. Uh, there's a, a variety of different kind of components of that as well. Uh, but we are kind of both an insurer and also own a provider system, Allegheny Health Network as well, and work really closely with a number of other kind of provider partners uh, within our footprint as well. So uh, that's a quick overview of where we're at and uh, excited to chat a little bit more. Awesome. And then I'll, I'll wrap up with my uh, quick introduction. So I'm Nick, uh, the CEO and one of the co-founders of Candid Health. Um, Candid Health is building a automated medical billing platform for healthcare providers. So the, we're, we're going to go very deep in this conversation on what are the challenges in this space, but we help uh, large providers, fast growing large providers navigate and automate the complexity of billing at scale. 
how do you, and our vision is how do you automate as much of this process as possible? And there are many pieces of automation. We're not going to, not going to go into many of them today, but a, a, a lot of the challenges we are trying to solve uh, with our customers are related to the topic that we're going to discuss in a little bit here. Um, my background, I uh, have been working on Candid the last uh, five years. Um, and then before that, I was at Palantir for five years where I led a lot of the healthcare work. So maybe to, to kick things off, um, the, as I mentioned, the, the overall topic today is mastering RSCM expansion. What are the challenges, solutions to for fast growing healthcare providers or large healthcare providers that are either national, do with a lot of payers, or um, all of the complexities go with, with being large. Um, and so maybe just to kick us off here, Marina, I might ask, Nourish, obviously very large, uh, as you as you mentioned, very fast growing, very national. Um, what are some of the challenges you guys have thought about and explored or, or went into um, as you've expanded medical billing across different states, different pairs? Yeah, definitely. Happy to answer that one, especially being kind of squarely on the provider side here. And so first, like I said, want to disaggregate like scaling just a company generally, especially in the healthcare space. And then from the actual challenges that you get once you're going either national or across a bunch of different payers. And so I think like scaling any company, but especially in healthcare has its own slew of challenges, right? Related to just the mass amounts of operational complexity and volume that comes with, you know, sending in thousands of claims a month or needing to get thousands of providers licensed and credentialed and integrate into all of your systems and things like that. And so I think like the first challenge that a lot of different providers and companies have is just taking a bunch of processes that maybe work very well at the start manual or having a few people owning them and being able to introduce a ton of like product and tech and guardrails there so that when you do have a thousand clinicians of whatever sort, you don't need to have an entire army of people on the back end just absolutely like spinning their wheels day in and day out. Um, when you actually start to think about then even expanding more nationally or among different payers, I think you get a whole nother set of challenges there just related to having a bit of a steep learning curve, I would say. And so for instance, like, especially when it comes to healthcare, right? Different states have different restrictions around how you're going to be delivering care, maybe how your providers need to be licensed or credentialed. Um, when you start to get into different payers, right? Like there's tons of different guidelines and regulations related to, again, how you deliver care and then how you code care. There's all the operational complexity with, you know, your actual like manual processes for sending in claims or working with a payer if issues arise and things like that. And so I think the big challenge there is like, first and foremost, just kind of understanding as you get into each new state and each new payer, like what the, the state of the union is and how you're supposed to be doing things. And then being able to have the tools in place so that if you have, you know, 50 different requirements or 100 or 200, however many, when you start to look at that matrix, that you're actually able to do those operationally at a really high level without hitting a bunch of roadblocks along the way. So I'd say like it really boils down to like having the knowledge and education you need to to actually be able to execute and then having the like tech and organization and structure in place so that you can actually like execute on that effectively. I'd be curious just to double click on that um, before I question, pass the question to you, Neil. I think Nourish has been pretty ahead of the curve on wanting to prepare for growth and streamline and automate. I'd be curious how you guys thought about the balance of building that army of folks internally that you described, which is a possible strategy. Many many organizations yeah. choose to do that strategy versus work with partners, look for automation, look for efficiencies. How did you guys think about that um, as, as you were kind of, I mean, you're still mm -hmm. growing so fast. How, how have you guys thought about that as, as you kind of go on this journey? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think like, to your point, like neither of those is a bad strategy. There's probably a time and a place for both. And even in one company's journey, there might be a time where you're leaning a lot more on people and leaning a lot more on technology. And so totally. I think for us, we've we've tried to be really strategic about forecasting out our growth well, and then sitting down and just having this discussion of, okay, what's going to like, you know, when I joined and we had five providers to when we had 50, 500, now we're at a thousand, like what is going to break when we hit that next phase of growth? And then you can just sit there and kind of logically lay out what the solution for, the, for those things are. And I think um, we do, we lot of, like to do a lot of different like ROI exercises versus, you know, what is the time and effort and energy related to, you know, automate something, whether that's doing that in-house within your own engineering team, whether that's working with an outside, outside vendor or contractor versus like 
what makes sense to to continue to own in-house because maybe it's a large engineering investment and you're not going to see the payoff for a long time. And I think the other piece that we think about too is like, how confident are we that we know the like solution, the long-term solution for it? Because it's, if you know, like, hey, in the ideal future state, here's exactly how we're going to run XYZ process related to RCM. Then like in most cases, assuming that you can hit your growth goals, like you might as well invest in the technology there. There's some places though, where it's a little more fuzzy and opaque. And you might say like, well, we, we know we need to fix this process, but there's a bunch of different ways that we could go about it. We're not sure which is the right one. In that case, like it might be better to invest in people while you like go through the motions, figure out what is the right solution and then invest in the technology piece as well. And so I do think we've just tried to to always have that strategy and be open-minded to there being a time and place for both, but just always kind of weighing the pros and cons of um, which one for like this very specific workflow or process makes sense for us like right now. Totally. Neil, um, over to you. What challenges are you seeing um, provider groups as they go they go big, they go national? Yeah, so good, good question. And I think some of this, and I bring a little bit of a different perspective, I think kind of sitting a little bit more broadly at payer provider where I don't work for a provider system, but I work with a lot of providers. I don't sit just at the payer side either. I kind of sit at the, at the middle of those types of things. So I think Marina, you talked about a, a little bit of this. So one is, hey, changing regulations, changing the rules from each state to say, hey, prior off rules, gold carding rules, how quickly are things moving in every different state? Understanding kind of CMS regulations and how quickly those are changing, understanding kind of each payer rules and how different those are. And for me, I'm also looking at it from how different is every provider and how I'm gonna be able to interact with each provider uh, as well. But I think part of that goes back to kind of one of the things that you were talking about is also understanding. And, and for me, I work with, I'd say, a lot of legacy provider systems that aren't necessarily all that new, that have been kind of used to doing things in certain ways. And thinking about kind of their evolution and transformation from a legacy rev cycle management function organization set of capabilities into what does the future look like as well. And so one, continually be able to kind of look at what should stay in-house, what is a core capability that's really critical to your business. What are the things that you should be looking at partners to be able to go deliver? Uh, what are the things that like, hey, you need to be a little bit more agile, that the space is moving really quickly. Back to your point, you might not want to go invest on an engineering team building something out to say three years from now, it might look very different than what it looks today. But how do you make sure you have some in-house oversight and management and ability to kind of quickly shift across those things is I think one of the challenges I've seen from some of our legacy provider partners that we work with as well. And I think the second aspect of that then is change management for functions and teams. And so when you look at a RCM function, it, it's it's hard to change a legacy function. There are people that are really used to, this is how this process works. This is how I've done this with this payer for the last five years, the last 10 years. I don't want to go do something as well. And so really looking at kind of where uh, the operating model and the partnership with vendors and others helps us accelerate that, I think is uh, really one of the critical aspects as you think about scaling nationally and, and scaling more globally too. Awesome. Uh, I saw a question in the, the Q&A, which I will uh, will answer in a second. The, uh, the other thing that I think we run into a lot, we obviously work with a bunch of different healthcare providers. You, you touched on, you both had touched on this, but as you start to work with more pairs, there's obviously certain rules and regulations around all the different pairs and how they want claims submitted, but there's other, there's other complexity that makes it challenging to work when you're working with tons of pairs too. And in, in today's world, you may not have just a vanilla fee for service contract. You might actually have a very complicated or some somewhat some version of a value-based contract. And so now you as a healthcare provider, as you scale, you're not only trying to figure out all the fee-for-service rules for all of your payers, you might also be trying to do your value-based contracts as well and, and submit claims for those. Um, and that gets hard, both just managing that complexity, but also just there aren't a lot of partners out there or pieces of software that actually do both of those really well. I mean, that's obviously one of the problems we at Candid are, are uh, solving, but the the kind of historical group of, of medical billing companies, a lot of them don't even handle that stuff. So there's, there's just not a lot of unless you're working with a newer innovator in the billing space, there's, there's not even tooling really to, to do what uh, you're trying to do. Um, 
the the first question here actually was, uh, what are all of your thoughts on prioritizing technology investments when expanding RCM operations? What should be the main criteria for deciding where to allocate resources? Marina, I think this might have been in response to something you said. Do you want to take the first take the first stab at that? Yes, definitely. Um, I'll caveat it by saying, obviously, it's going to vary a ton for each company and practice and where you are in your journey. But I'd say, like, when I think about prioritizing tech for RCM ops, like. The framework that I would use is, you know, where is my team spending the most time today, right? Because that's obviously the like most bang for your buck for automating and potentially also like where, where are things breaking the most? So, you know, and that could be either in the sense of, again, like something is going wrong on the back end for the team, or it could be from a patient experience perspective too. Like where are we really missing the mark on a patient experience that we want to, to be doing a lot better here? And so for us, like we always think about the, you know, the classic framework of like, let's say, you know, effort versus impact or ROI when it comes to different decision making. And so I would, again, like the, to really simplify it, it would be like, okay, where are we spending the most time? Where is the patient experience being the most impacted? And then the last one that I think Neil and I both touched upon is like, how confident are we that we know what the right solution is? And we're not going to have to just remake this like six months down the line. So that's, I think those are the big areas that I think about when prioritizing. Neil, any thoughts on that one? Yeah, so I, I generally agree. I think the one addition I'd kind of make is also making sure you're looking at kind of the investments uh, from like a long-term horizon perspective of like, hey, you want to have a couple of bets across that entire ecosystem to say, hey, certain things, near-term ROI, they're going to drive start driving value in months, if not weeks, and kind of you're going to start seeing that stuff in the next year. And so really focusing a set and probably a high majority of your investments in those types of areas, given where the industry is, people need ROI quick. But making sure then you're also holding both capacity investment capability for, I'd say, some moonshots to say there might be something that might be three years out. And you have a sense of, I'd say, fortitude that that like that's the right thing, or you think that that is kind of where your organization, where like patient experience, member experience, things are going. And you might not see a near-term ROI on that thing, but it's going to be critical to your long-term strategy, your growth, and you're making sure that you're not necessarily putting every single dollar and set of capacity in the near-term thing. And then you're looking forward to say, I'm three years out and I haven't done anything transformative that actually is driving kind of the next step function of innovation uh, for the organization as well. And so just one, I think that would be the one other ad to say, hey, make sure you're keeping both mental time with your teams and yourself and uh, kind of capital allocation to be able to kind of figure out what those moonshot ideas and investments that you're going to make in that area too. Totally. Yeah. Sorry, what were you going to say, Maria? Oh, I, I was just going to add on. I think that's a, a great point. And I think it's easy to say like, oh, you should just do both. Do the short-term efficiency gains and do the long-term. But obviously no one is ever going to have unlimited resources to do everything. So I do think that's a great point of, of trying to find a bit of the yin and the yang there. Yeah. I'd say on the long-term, the one other caveat is like, I'm not suggesting and saying, hey, don't have a way to look at ROI on those things, but understand that it might be a little bit longer to get to ROI. So even if you're looking at a something that has a, a three-year investment, five-year investment, that's a little bit more kind of uh, harder to track, what are the metrics that you're going to be looking at 12 months, 24 months in that kind of give you confidence that, hey, it's going to be delivering kind of the type of impact I expect to go see. And so one of the areas as we start thinking about things that drive like patient personalization, patient engagement, like you might not be able to track that in the same way to say, hey, this drove uh, kind of repeat business from that person. If the person came back a second, third, fourth time, that might take a little bit while for you to prove out. Um, so, but ha having kind of near term ways to track that, that I'm on the right trajectory is a thing to keep in mind. Totally. The only other thing I would add, um is, and this is where I think a lot of other billing platforms maybe focus on the wrong thing. I would, I think it's also important when you think about where you're spending your dollars, where you want ROI is, is folk, are you, are you actually making sure you're actually solving the root problem and not solving the wrong problem? I think, for example, a lot of billing companies or billing platforms will make it easier to appeal claims. There's a lot of interest in like automating phone calls with insurance and that's super valuable. Um, definitely adds a lot of efficiency. Uh, for example, at Candid, we, we emphasize, we're gonna have to do that stuff, but we're much more focused. I think this is a big difference for us is how do you avoid those problems altogether? 
And so like, are you, are you investing in the right place? Are you investing? Can you invest upstream to actually solve your down, downstream problem that's causing you a lot of pain? Um, it might be the case. And we see this a lot where, where when you're a large provider and you are submitting a lot of claims, you can create a lot of work for yourself for having misconfigured your billing system and submit even for a week or two or three before someone catches it. Um, reporting is another thing you probably want to invest in just so you have visibility in what you're doing to make sure you're catching this stuff. But uh, how do you how do you catch that stuff as soon as possible? And like investing upstream to just avoid creating really big holes that are very expensive to, to fix later. Um, there was another question that came in and Marina, this one was directed to, at you. Can you talk about the different growth inflection points and in going from five to 1000 providers that affected slash broke processes and growing companies should think about? I, I yes. bet that never happened. <laughs> it was super smooth sailing. Yeah, everything's been yeah. perfect from the get go. So unfortunately no answer. <laughs> um, yeah, there's been a ton of different like growth and inflection points. I'd say like you, you feel it a lot going from, let's say like five to a hundred and then probably again at the like 300 mark to 500 mark and a thousand. It's like the goalposts start to shift a little bit, which is great. And I do like to think about this as a slight side note is like when I joined nurse, it's like, I knew every single dietitian's name. I knew what all their specialties were. I, I knew so much about them. And obviously when there's a thousand, it runs a lot differently. And I think that's a good a good metaphor for how it is when you're running a lot of the different operations of a company too. Um, in terms of like the different inflection points, like as you know, Nick started to touch upon, like there's a lot of processes that can work well or work just fine with like five to 20 clinicians that don't work when you start to hit 50 or a hundred. So I think things like, you know, having claim submission being a very manual process, that's something that um, once you start to hit that like 5,200 mark, I think really does not work well without a massive team and a massive team is frankly hard to achieve and hard to run really well as well. And, um, when you think about all the like post claim workflows that come about too, right? Like, again, no matter how much you try to prevent it front, you'll always have probably some portion of denial, some portion of patient responsibility, things like that. The manual work needed for all of those flows, I think really starts to pick up as well. Once you start to hit the, let's say like, you know, 300, 500 providers as well. And so I think the biggest thing that you can do here to try to like prevent things from breaking is really just force yourself to sit down and do the kind of road mapping exercise where you're looking at all of your current processes in your system. And you say, what would it take if just tomorrow I was to, you know, hit X, Y, Z number of new providers, whether that's two Xing or three Xing or five Xing and just say like, would, you know, let's say my process for claim submission, would this, would this work without many providers? Okay. If not, what would I need to do to get there? Whether again, that's tech or people. And then you can start to get into the weeds and evaluate what the right aspect is there. But um, there's, I think each new phase of growth is exciting and you're kind of solving a different problem each time. The problems don't get easier. In fact, a lot of the problems get bigger and more complex because you've solved the kind of easy stuff to begin with. But um, I think the one thing you can count on is that like each phase of growth is going to be different. And so you just need to have a good framework or structure for, for, uh, kind of forecasting what those inflection points are going to be or when things are going to be break and then trying to get ahead of it. This might be an impossible question to ask answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. And if it's, there's no answer, that's totally fine. We can move on. For fast growing provider organizations that are going national, do you think, do you guys think it is, which part do you think is harder? The actual claim submission part conforming to all the different payer rules um, and all the complexity of your contracts or managing all the complexity around bringing on so many providers and managing the provider complexity of making all the credentialing stuff's up to date, all of um, they're linked to contracts. So when you submit claims are actually like linked on the payer side, um, like the logistics of bringing on all the scale of providers. Both of those are super important from an RCM perspective. Like we have in our product places to store all that information because we, we obviously need that to submit claims correctly. But uh, I'd be curious if you get if either of you have a take on either of those being harder than the other, or they might just be equally hard. I think they, they they each have their own kind of complexities of hardness, and so I think depending on what maybe where you've made investments, where you're at uh, as an organization, one might be a little bit more challenging than the other. But like Nick, to your point, I think they have to go a little bit hand in hand, and so I think that's where we have seen a lot of the challenges that kind of we've faced across payer provider. Of uh, hey, right now, how do I link demographic information to the claim submission process? How do I make sure then that's accurate from a payer's directory? How am I going through the attestation process? How do I make sure I'm not sending conflicting information kind of across payer provider? 
that might be like actually driving confusion and creating like more back and forth right now. I think that's one of the hardest parts that I've kind of seen to say, hey, what I'm either sending to a payer or a provider, it, I'm sending five different pieces of information that say five absolutely different things right now. And it's all potentially the same data set. And so kind of bringing that together is uh, a really big challenge. Totally. Yeah, cool. I agree completely on that one. And I think like, when you think about all the kind of upstream stuff that you mentioned of like, before you can even bill a claim, obviously all these different steps need to happen. I think I think a lot of that is an exercise in just like ops excellency and really like tightening your operation, operating processes, right? So it's like being able to really establish clear structure and guidance for how you are able to credential people quickly and, and ideally working with payers in situations, right, to make that more efficient. Um, I think on the, like, what you touched upon on the claim submission front is like some of the complexity there just truly comes from trying to like understand as the first step what the different requirements are and then being able to build those into the system. And so equally hard in different ways, uh, equally fun to solve in different ways too, though. Totally. And I think importantly, and we can move on to the next section because I know we're uh, cruising through our time here. Um, I think one of the biggest differences, one of the things we do at Canada, but I think probably one of the trends we will continue to see over the next many years as, as we go through innovation in RCM is those both need to be tracked in the same platform because they're so interrelated to your point, Neil. And I think historically that was not the case, but I think we're just going to see deeper and deeper integrations between the RCM platforms and like the actual submit this claim and the, the repositories where you store this information because it's so, if you get any of that stuff wrong, that claim is going to get adjudicated incorrectly or, or something's going to go wrong. And so um, we've obviously built that into our platform, but I think that's just a trend we'll continue to see. Whereas in the last 20 years, I think those are pretty disparate. A lot of stuff's living in spreadsheets. Um, we've talked a lot about the problems and challenges. Maybe shifting gears here for a second, um, be curious to, to ask you both, what are you seeing as the solutions that people are, are either in Norris or elsewhere embracing to uh, solve these challenges? So like from a process perspective, technologies, other stuff of just that you're you're excited and help has helped you've seen help scale. Yeah, so happy to go first. I mean, so I think a little bit of like probably one aspect is I'd say probably over talked about in just terms of automation. And Nick, you talked a little bit about it. Like I feel like if you look at the last five years, we kind of went through the trial of disillusionment from an automation perspective of everyone is saying they can automate every aspect of every capability and function within the rev cycle. And yeah. we were going to take a hundred person organization and turn it into a negative hundred person organization. And so I think if, if you kind of look uh, past some of that right now, I think we're actually coming out and there are a lot of really good automation opportunities. So I think that gives me some aspect of, like, I'm excited about that. But I think that the place that I'm kind of the most excited about from kind of a, a tech stack investment is, I talked a little about this before, how do we think about personalization and patient engagement in context of road cycle management to say, if I'm thinking about patient access or I'm thinking about like, hey, actually sending bills to the patient as well, how do we actually do that in a way that is meaningful and personalized to that individual that's going to get them to engage? And when I get them to engage, how do I help them do other things that are really critical as well to say, hey, if, if I'm asking them to go pay a bill for a visit right now, is there an opportunity for us to kind of engage them on something else that we might need them to do as a blended payer provider or someone else mm -hmm. to drive health like outcomes, to drive lower cost of care? How do we do it in a way that the person's acting to respond to? What's the messaging? What's the channel that you want to communicate? Do you know that Nick's more likely to uh, respond to a text at 7 p.m. versus Marina's more likely to respond to a chat or an email? And so I think kind of creating that stickiness for the, the person is something I'm really excited about. Uh, I just had it happen yesterday. I had a terrible experience, which with my a speech therapist for my daughter, and I left that appointment saying, I hate this place. I never want to come back right now. And so one bad experience and kind of what that means for, I mean, I was at the point where I wanted to go on Google and I wanted to write a bad review, but I also think I was like, well, wow. my daughter goes there from a, a speech therapy perspective. Um, but the, the flip side, how do you delight people and deliver like a really, like, that was an awesome experience. And I know billing and rev cycle might not be the thing that we think about to say you can delight people. But if we start to think about things like 
hey, financial estimates and giving people kind of early financial estimates and actually then following up with them to say, here's what your discrepancy was. We quoted you a hundred bucks and we actually billed you for 120, but here's why, here's why that was different. And here's the other thing that actually ended up ha happening. And so being able to drive personalization, patient engagement, that's what gets me excited as kind of an opportunity for organizations to differentiate and for us to deliver kind of better experiences to people that meet their mental models where healthcare has continued to fail them. Love that. Love that. Marina, yeah, any think, thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely. I'll, uh, I have I have a separate area that I'm also really excited about, but I do agree completely with what Neil's saying on the patient experience. And like, we see that nourish all the time, probably the number one area that like prospective patients reach out about that they want to know before they're right to sign up is related to insurance coverage. And it totally makes sense, right? It's like affordability is probably the single biggest factor in accessibility for patients. And as Neil mentioned, like, I think a lot of it is opaque for patients today. And it's like, there's an element of just like better education that we should all be doing. And then also an element of like, how can we make things less complex for patients, more straightforward to understand, to get better visibility up front. And then when something happens for them to just very easily understand what's happening. And, and uh, as Neil mentioned too, it's like, you, you might not think of RCM as being so such a huge part of the patient experience, but it truly is because like, you can absolutely love, love, love your doctor. And then if you have a horrible billing experience with them, like you're honestly probably not going to go back and you're going to, you know, not think so fondly of them. And so I just agree that like, this is a huge area for opportunity. This is probably one of the biggest pain points, I think for almost all providers out there is like being able to get very accurate, you know, eligibility estimates and coverage and benefits and all that. Um, to answer your original question though, the area that I'm most excited about for tech stack, I think like Aside from all the automation stuff that we already talked about, which I think is super important, I think the next like really big frontier for RCM technology is going to get really into like data analysis and probably using AI, the buzzword, to be able for to really help providers like truly understand their claims data and how their orgs are functioning and different trends in RCM. And I think like there's just uh, so much you know room for improvement here for practices to be able to like truly really understand their data in and out and use that to make decision making in terms of, you know, how they're, you know, accepting patients into care, how they're billing and coding things. And um, so I just think the whole world of using data for claim insights and then using that to guide patient care is, is super exciting. And I know there's a lot of companies out there that are really investing in this. And historically, it's something that I think each practice has been kind of on their own to either hopefully first even get good data, which, you know, a lot of the older like legacy EMRs and things, it's almost hard to even get your data out of the system. But then once totally. you have that data, be able to at scale very quickly ingest large amounts and make great insights and use that to guide decision making. Totally. I think that is one of like providers that probably want to do this for such a long time, but it is getting, making your data useful and operationalizing it and getting both those insights just for like into your, your spinning clams or Neil, to your point, like what does this patient owe or like, what do I need? Like I need to hit, uh, I have value-based contracts. I need patients to do something like get that stuff in real time and have it accurate. Like getting that information is the tip of a very large data iceberg. Of do you have does does your tooling and data infrastructure even let you get that information? And I feel that in so many of the older generation of EMRs, billing companies just don't let you do that. Um, and yep. I think yeah, it, it's one of the most important things like we've invested in on the candid side of just like making the making billing companies are data companies fundamentally you need you need really outstanding reporting you need to be able to work with and see the data because at the end of the day billing at scale is a data operationalization problem it's like i need the right piece of data at the right time either for a patient or some right or, or somewhere and and that is the tip of a very large iceberg the most i'd say the last generation of, of kind of incumbent billing companies in emr just didn't have the technology or or ability to do um yeah. The one other thing I was going to mention, I think the other really interesting opportunity is how do you move parts of kind of the RCM function further upstream to say, mm -hmm. hey, there's things that we do from a, maybe not claims oriented things, but we do from a coding aspect or other things that are done on the back end after a provider interaction or after a provider went and kind of did a note and we're going and kind of adjusting that note for certain things. But how do you start driving things like ambient clinical intelligence, uh, actually support the provider 
at the moment that they're talking to the patient, at the moment that they're actually entering things into their EMR and documenting things right now? And how does that eliminate work for kind of the RCM function? And how does that drive back to your data component? How does that drive insights back to that provider, either when they're prepping for the patient that they're about to see, when they're like actually doing those things then versus the way that, that a lot of the work happens right now, it's duplicative. It's a second, it's a third, it's a fourth touch that you do on the same thing three or four times right now. So drive a portion of that work completely upstream right now. And I think we're, we're kind of getting to both the technology and kind of the, the willingness of organizations to do that. Totally love that. What has been, um, I'd be curious, put into practice, um, either in Nourish or elsewhere, if you guys were advising a fast growing healthcare organization, what are the pieces of technology you've seen be implemented? Not necessarily unsolved problem. Like there are, there are people who can actually solve the problem. Like where in the tech stack would you recommend people to actually be making investments or seriously take a look? Like which, which, parts, which problems do you think are actually, there are actually things out there that, that solve this problem well or will in the short term. Um, some of these problems I think are just hard problems that are still unyet solved. Like eligibility, I think depends a lot on the data you get back from payers, which is uh, mixed, I'll, I'll say. Um, what, what would you guys be advising people to, to invest in today? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, there are so many different directions you can take this. Like I would probably think about like the actual RCM flow and breaking up the different steps of the revenue cycle. Right. But as we spoke about, there's like the step one that Neil just touched upon, which is like, how are you even preparing claims to begin with getting all the just data that you need to get on the claim is step one. And step two is then actually like preparing a neat claim, submitting those off to the payers. And then step three is like, okay, as you're getting that data back from the payers, what sort of tools are you using to like look at those, understand the data, visualize it, and then take next steps on it. I think um, the big chunk, obviously, like Candid is awesome at this in the middle of like everything related to cleaning and getting claims submitted in a very like efficient and a manner that's preventing human error. I think for me, that's like probably the first area I'd have a company focus on because that's like the meat of the process is in that. And I think that that's an area where like the most human error comes out and the most time is spent. And so probably step one, I think is like that middle process of like, how are you like cleaning all the data that you need for claims, submitting off the payers and then getting that visualized back to you. Um, there's like other odds and ends tools. Like I think there's again, ways that you can get eligibility estimates at scale, which work for very extensive to different companies, but they can help on the operational side. I think um, having a good like BI tool to be able to actually like visualize and, and cut and analyze the data is important. I think you know, ideally either an, either an internal billing script or an outside, you know, provider that you're using to pull all of the data and get the claim prep, the stage before you're even submitting it through a billing provider, like is another area, but um, so kind of everywhere along the cycle, I think you can do, hopefully that's not a cop out, but I do think that middle step of like everything related to cleaning claims, getting them submitted and seeing it visualized back, is like probably at least step one of what I would do, because that I think is the bulk of the work. I'm curious, Neil, if you have a different yeah. perspective on that so one. So I, I would generally agree with that, maybe with a couple other additions or caveats to say kind of anything upfront in the process. So whether you're looking at patient access to say, hey, acquire the right insurance information. Like we see a, really, a high percentage of claims denials are, hey, fat fingered or the wrong information around like the insurance information. And so kind of investing in the setup capabilities kind of upfront in that kind of patient journey and kind of the, the entire web cycle experience, I think are gonna have a bigger bang for your buck versus Nick, you said it earlier, if you go fix it on the back end with the claims now, yep, that's great, but it's kind of higher ROI, better bang for your buck to go fix it before it happens and before it becomes an issue and focus on data quality, data cleanliness upfront in terms of how do you work with payers in a different way? How do you actually get information from them APIs to fire formats. Um, so I think that that would be kind of the the only additional component, Marina, that I didn't mention to what you said. How are you using them? We've talked about eligibility a little bit. Um, eligibility, obviously, is a super important part of the process. Very hard still, in my opinion, and broadly unsolved because you're just dealing with information that the pair sends back to you. And sometimes that's good and sometimes it's off. But I'd be curious about, um, Marina and Neil, how you didn't recommend or advise other other fast growing companies or how you guys thought about those two particular steps around what are what are the must-haves like what top performing organizations what do you need to be doing on those sides and 
leaning in, like there's a lot of energy around providing upfront estimates. How successful have you seen those types of estimates? How are you seeing the best companies manage? Cause there's variability in there, like manage that message to the patient. Um, we still see like, obviously like in our product, we, we automate the eligibility check, but not all organizations I, I think are still audit, like actually doing eligibility using the API is some of them are actually calling the insurance company still for every, or they're using an automated product. There's a lot of LLM technology out there now to automate those calls. How are you guys thinking about um, eligibility? Maybe I'll talk to you. Say, Neil, yeah. Uh, we, we talk about it. Neil, do you want to start first and I'll, I'll add on? Yeah, I, I honestly, like, so probably not as much in my area given, hey, we're not directly a provider system. So I think we have been focused on how do we kind of give the right information to the providers that we work with and how do you make it available in multi-channels in the ways that they want to interact? Uh, so I think it's challenging. I think the other thing that we have been really been focused on as well is how do we simplify and think about simplification of our, like the, the broad insurance product structure of uh, one of the challenges with eligibility right now also is when you look at self-funded groups, when you look at kind of those types of things, there's a bunch of carve out of this, carve in of this, carve out of this, carve in of yes. this. Once you get into that, it's not a, oh, here's your Highmark or Aetna or United or whoever product right now. Uh, and I think from a provider perspective, it becomes really challenging because, hey, every product, uh, an insurance product, every member is so unique because of how that ecosystem has come into play. So one of the things that we're really starting to push on is how do we drive insurance product simplification to say, how do we actually kind of say, hey, here's what your standard product generally will look like. Um, and how do we kind of minimize the customization? We're always going to have some aspect of that as well. But uh, how do we minimize that to the scenarios where you really need it versus we did it without actually understanding uh, the, the reason to go do that as well. So I would say that's actually one interesting component that we're looking at more from a insurance perspective to make yeah. it a little bit easier for both the patient, the member, or the provider to understand what's what's covered and not covered by this person's uh, insurance. I love that. I wish, I hope all pairs are thinking yeah. about that. I mean, the, the other example I'd give in that scenario, I, uh, and I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, like preventative benefits and preventative benefit schedules for us. I, I There's probably tens of thousands, if not more uh, ways that we use, use that. Like that's really hard for a person, let alone a provider to understand like a preventative benefit isn't the preventative benefit. Like, and so how do we start to standardize that to say, there's only three different ways that we're going to do preventative benefits with one of these. Like, again, I don't think we're going to get there tomorrow, but I think that is a big challenge for the industry and a big thing that we have been pushing on. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I think like both of those totally hit the nail on the head. I would love, I'm going to echo Nick here. I would love if there was more standardization. As you said, like, I think eligibility is probably the single biggest struggle I feel that I have heard from both working in healthcare and also speaking with tons of other healthcare providers. And I think especially with something like Nourish, where we're doing primarily telehealth care, right? That's that's newer to be accepted at a broad scale by insurance. And then for us to like nutrition relative to other services provided by providers is also like a, a bit more nascent. And so I think, you know, some of the struggles that we deal with is that just even on the payer side, like some of the systems don't include all the codes and things that we might need to get good eligibility estimates on the uh, specifically related to nutrition care. And, but I know that this problem is not unique just to nutrition. There's plenty of other no. specialties that, that struggle with it too, as well. And it's so, every specialty. It's not, <laughs> yeah, not nutrition for sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I, I think you're spot on that like patient eligibility for me is probably still the biggest like unsolved problem and issue. And I think like for a lot of practices, like essentially the answer ends up being that you need to like triangulate from a number of different sources, whether patient is going to be covered or not. And as, as you mentioned, Nick, there's a lot of times where even if you are going through the classic APIs and things you need to like, you know, ping a payer and get someone's eligibility, it, it might not actually have all the data you need to see if they're covered or not. And and we've even seen, even at times, if you call, you, know, you might actually get different answers if you talk to different reps and things like that. that. That's not true across the board, but there are struggles, like no matter which avenue you choose. And so I think to Neil's point, like the more that we can simplify the system as a whole is super important. And then again, as, as we mentioned earlier, I think the other big piece is just, again, like educating patients more on what the process looks like so that yeah. 
they're not seeing surprises in their coverage as well. Yeah, totally. I think we think about this a couple of ways from our perspective. One of the main things we invest in, try to help with here is again, visibility into the data. Because some pairs are, when you break it down, some pairs are actually quite good at eligibility and estimates on, and some you might not be for reasons you may not realize or know. But if you're giving really good data and reporting on the back end of your process of your system, you can start to see, oh, I'm actually really bad at this pair. And then you can start to uh, like dig into your eligibility responses to figure out what did you think was going to happen versus what actually happened. And then you can tune the system. We, I think a lot of the, the um, ethos of our product is around that like continual refinement of you're submitting these claims, you're you're doing your eligibility checks, you look and then you look at the results and then you reinvest that stuff back into your rules engines and your automation to continue to optimize and improve this. Um, and eligibility, I think is one of the big ones where um, it can take some tuning, particularly if you're in, like Nurse mentioned, like a, a more nascent, not, not all eligibility endpoints or eligibility um, services handle all the codes equally well. Um, they'll just handle like general e &M code. So super interesting. I think um, one ad I was gonna make to that, I think it's also, and Marina you started to talk about that, how do you contextualize the eligibility with the right like other information to say, hey, eligible for X, but only a certain set number of visits or hey, eligible after a certain like thing happens as well, or then eligible, but like not covered until you meet your, like, like all of those complexities. And then how do you kind of pair that with, hey, what's your deductible information? Like how do you, like for a, a, a person at the end of the day, like you need to contextualize it like with that whole picture to say, but you haven't met your total out of pocket max or you haven't met your deductible. So yes, it's eligible, but you're still gonna have a copay. You're gonna have a coinsurance. Like what does that look like? And more often than not, I think uh, on the payer side, we might just say, oh, yep, first, like has a benefit, they're eligible without actually providing all of that other information that, that you kind of need as a provider to be able to say, okay, let me actually go now tell the person what their out of pocket is going to be for this thing. So they know what that's going to be before they come in. Uh, so I think that's the other aspect of like, answer, you might answer the one question that's asked without saying, here's the four other things that you need to know. Totally. Again, I think that goes back to that context point we're making. If you just need your system, whatever tech stack you are using needs to present that information to you so you have it all there. Um, and it's just so hard to do that, um, particularly with the older older technologies. There, there was a question in, in chat. Um, are there new areas in billing that Nourish and Candid, and I'm going to add that are excited about going forward? Um, Marina, what are you excited about in the, like, the next generation? Things you haven't talked about of... of billing going forward yeah that's a good question it's broad i think there's a lot um there's a lot to be excited about i think the piece that i mentioned i think the two pieces that we've been just kind of like holding it on are still very accurate here which is like i think there's going to be so much investment and development re made related to just getting so much better data, data visibility and like tools and things to be able to analyze that and i think like that is going to be the crux of providing an amazing experience for patients and an amazing billing experience. And then I think um, any of these tools, again, that Neil started to touch on that are really geared at the patient experience on a broad level, patient engagement, patient billing, like how can you, you know, as we always say, like meet the patient where they are at any given point in time. And again, I think all of that ties into the RCM sphere. And I think the one thing that's easy to forget sometimes, which is a bit of a side note, is that like, how you handle RCM as a company really actually then filters into like the clinical level care a patient is getting. Because if someone has, you know, 10 visits covered versus three, you know, your provider's going to approach that differently. Or if someone has $100 copay visit versus 10, like they might be able to do a fewer number of visits and that's going to also impact their care. And so I think just like, again, all these things that are geared at giving patients more visibility, giving providers more visibility into like what exactly that journey for the patient is going to look like. I think it helps you as a provider on the back end. It helps your relationship with payers. It helps payers thrive. And then from a patient perspective, it it helps them plan their care too and get the most out of it as well. I love that you mentioned that. And it reminded me of something. Um, I think that it's also one of the other challenges. Again, I know I think a lot in terms of data and tech stacks, but like the last generation of blank tech stack, there oftentimes wasn't a place to put that information. Like there's, there's been so much in for innovation on the payer side, it seems like, of like complexity of how many visits will we cover? Or how many of this benefit, uh, units of this benefit does this patient have? And in many 
platforms for billing, you literally have no place to put that. Um, so you might have the information and it's stuck in some unstructured text field that you can't operationalize that. Like that's something we think a lot about at Candid is creating places, machine readable places that we can leverage in the automation to say like, you have this many of this thing. Uh, even if that information was collected manually, someone literally called. Um, sometimes you can get that automatically, but sometimes you might call like create a place in the billing platform to put that information so that your your rules engine, your automation, other places can actually leverage that. It's just such, there's just so much greenfield opportunity there. At the last, I don't mean to pick on it, but like just the last generation of billing companies, I don't think kept up with that complexity um, on the on the value-based contracting stuff, the stuff around like benefit design. There's just so much complexity that's that's been created and probably in, Importantly so, but um, in many cases, but just like making sure that you have something to actually use that stuff. Um, I, look, I think I was about to cut you off, Neil. You were about to say something. Or no, something. I, think, I think Marina, again, agree with a lot you said. I think the one other place that I would would kind of mention that, hey, interesting. I don't think we've necessarily kind of figured it out by, by any means, but how do you start kind of shifting eventually from a individual encounter based type of model to a, hey, here's what my care plan is to say, hey, I have whatever my condition is uh, right now. And I think in the next six months or a year, here's the 10 things that are going to happen. I'm going to have to go get an MRI. I'm going to go have to go do this. I'm going to have to go to do like X, Y, Z before I get my knee replacement. And so how do you start kind of migrating to like a little bit more of a, from an individual, like encounter by encounter, procedure by procedure type of, of billing experience, even for patients, to a little bit more of a longitudinal to say, here's what I should expect to pay in the next six months to manage this aspect of my care. And here's how that is going to, uh, to flow across the one, mm. two, three different providers that I work with right now on those things as well. So mm. again, not a place I'd say we are not there yet by any means, but I think that's an interesting kind of place for us to be able to go over the next, I'd say, couple of years. Totally, super interesting. Um. From my perspective on this topic, we haven't touched on uh, the trendy buzzwords uh, AI at all. I, I do think the LLM, the, the new Gen AI LLM, let's automate this phone call type thing is interesting. I think I am more interested, and again, like this goes back to our company and product ethos. I, if you're doing billing well, I think you're avoiding most of the phone calls. Um, and so how do you use machine learning AI to actually just avoid submitting claims incorrectly the first time? I think that, that's a metric we care a lot about internally. It's just how do you maximize the number of claims submitted correctly the first time? You have, you've successfully incorporated and managed all of the complexity for, I know how this payer, what this payer wants. Like I know what their published rules are, how they, how they ask their claims to be submitted. I know what my contract is. I know all the information about my providers. I have all this stuff. There's, a, there's this uh, other part that we haven't really talked about on, on the machine learning side where I'm excited for, for Candid to be, to be working on and getting into which is we have a lot of data for how claims have been submitted. Um, we can use that data to predict when claims are going to be denied or adjudicated out of network or some predict how the claim is going to be adjudicated to help avoid issues where uh, catch that stuff up front. Again, to your point, you'll catch it as soon as you can upstream before claims go out the door because the second it went out the door, um, you, you have two problems. One, when you were a large organization, super costly. Like one little accident, like you, you entered something wrong into your billing system and all of a sudden 10,000 claims went out the door in a very short period of time. You have a lot of cleanup work to do. But then two, um, uh, those are all very painful phone calls um, to, or, or how are you getting those claims, those claims fixed? And so using machine learning to, to predict when, when those things are, are going to happen um, ahead of time, I think I'm particularly excited about and is uh, something we're, we're focused on and, and, and candid. Um, I think the phone call stuff is interesting as well. You, I don't think for a while you're automating the phone call is probably an important part of the platform. Um, yeah. I think internally, at least for us, I'm more excited right now about avoiding the phone calls altogether. I think the one I'm excited about kind of from a probably less AI, but kind of LLM, Gen AI perspective, but talked a little about kind of the, the upstream and moving stuff upstream. But if I think about like ambient again, to say, hey, I have a like thing that is listening to my encounter between the patient mm -hmm. and my provider. It's using an LLM to then 
create the note, like do the coding, like all of that type of stuff, do the after visit summary, contextualize, take other information, apply kind of other set of AI rules to say, hey, I know this person has this insurance. And so these are the ways that they need to code that. So to be able to bring a lot of that upstream, yeah. um, taking ambient data of the actual encounter and kind of then adding every other piece of data that you already know about that payer and that person and actually informing how that stuff is coded up front and how totally. and claims filed, I think is going to be an interesting opportunity too. Totally. Yeah, we didn't even talk about that. We talked a lot about patient impact on, of, of billing and RCM, particularly at scale, but also there is that, um, there's a lot of pain created for providers when you're also at scale and you do things badly or poorly and you need a lot of going back to providers for, for, for various things. Super painful. Yeah, and I would say like, I'm guessing most providers, RCM is probably not what like is, gets them out of bed in the morning, you say, right? That's probably not why they went to medical school or whatever school they went to. And uh, I agree, like completely with that. And I do think the more you can bring AI and as Neil said, like even in the patient experience, like it actually probably frees up the, the clinician to be more present in the moment and have a more human human interaction and be able to focus on the care journey and the things that really matter too. So I love the idea that like things that you're doing bring technology and throughout the funnel can both help the patient in their billing experience, but it can also help just truly provide a better clinical experience, which is obviously what each provider group out there is trying to do at the end of the day. Totally. I know we're uh, running short on time here, a couple of minutes. Any last thoughts? Maybe we'll just open it up for either of you. Any last thoughts on um, challenges or solutions um, for, for, or anything we didn't otherwise touch on for, for navigating growing a provider organization uh, at large scales nationally with lots of payers. Yeah, I mean, I think we talked about a lot of exciting stuff here. I think like my key strategies I'd say is like summary takeaways from all this is like definitely try to invest in tech early. Again, it's not always the solution, but right from the get-go, you should always have that mindset, at least what you're building towards or what you want to eventually get towards. I think um, getting a lot of great visibility into your data and really using that to guide decision-making. So just force yourself to be like in the day-to-day -day and in day out. And I think the third thing I'd say is like one of our values at Nourish is to really think from first principles. And so just constantly on the RCM front, like as you scale, uh, the hurdles keep changing and, and everything you're doing is changing day in, day out. Like just force yourself to sit down and think like, do my processes still work today, right? Don't take it as a given. It's easy to get comfortable and say like, this is how I've done things forever. Like why you do this way? Oh, well, we've always done it this way. Force yourself to just sit down and think through like, what could we be doing differently? Is this actually the best way to be doing it? And use that to guide whatever decisions you're making in RCM as well. Yep. So Maria, I think you, you took one of my ones, which was going to be like, hey, be be willing on whether it's an annual, whatever the right basis is, revisit your operating model. What's centralized versus decentralized? What's in-house versus what's outsourced? What's your technology model? What have you built? What have you bought? What's your organizational model? What are you near sharing? What are you keeping on shore? What do you, like, re, be willing to revisit every single one of those things on a like structured cadence right now. So I think when, when I look at kind of just what is happening right now, like pace of advancement is really significant. And so I think for the organizations that aren't willing to sit down and say like, I'm purposely gonna spend time thinking about this and what that needs to look like in three years, you're gonna look back and say, shit, I, I missed, I missed this thing. I missed this entire trend. And now yep. I'm playing catch up and totally. that's going to be a lot harder than kind of making the upfront time to, to make that happen too. I can't underscore that point enough. I, I think about the role like that and it really resonates with me. The pace of advancement is crazy right now, particularly on the pair yeah. side of just like the amount of stuff that a provider needs to handle on a day to day. It, you need infrastructure that helps you keep up with that. Um, it's not a set it and forget it problem. It is constantly changing um regular and you need a very flexible stack uh to be able to handle that i love that point i think we're out of time thank you thank you both so much for for having the conversation i i enjoyed this hope everyone listening also enjoyed um yeah 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 thanks so much this was fun to chat rcm so love very, it very fun i appreciate the time thank you to candid health and to everyone that joined us today Please visit our website at community.hlth.com to catch up on all Health Go Live webinars. And join us in Las Vegas, October 20th through 23rd for Health 2024.